Thank you very much. Further debate, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I am pleased to stand on behalf of the fine folks in Oshawa uh, here in this, in this legislature to add our voices um, on the motion to extend the emergency orders um, until the end of June. This has been quite a, an interesting stretch of time, as we have heard many in this House um, refer to. Um, there have been many anecdotes that we have learned from our community members, from our community organizations, that we have learned from sectors and industry. My, my colleague from Temiskaming, Cochrane, um, shared with us much about the food processing world. Um, we're, we're learning things that we never thought we would have to um, in terms of the specifics around COVID-19. There have been a number of challenges and a number of really special opportunities um, to grow. When I look at my community, and while I'm going to take this opportunity today to highlight some of the needs and the areas where we need to focus with care to improve the circumstance and situation, I'm also going to say that I'm so impressed with the commitment of community organizations, with the volunteerism, with the, um, the heart and the soul of my neighbors and community members, as an, I am sure all of my colleagues around this house, regardless of stripe, are hearing the same heartwarming stories in their communities, businesses that have stepped up and stepped forward, um, individuals who have put together initiatives who are you know, connecting with their, their loved ones and their neighbors. Uh, some of the long-term or retirement homes, I mean, certainly we, I'm going to speak about that at length in a in a gut-wrenching capacity, but when we look at some of the retirement homes and long-term care homes that are doing kind and good things with the families to help them connect with their loved ones on the inside, um, there are heartwarming pieces to this. Um, but we are, you know, we, we are making decisions that impact and affect everyone. Uh, across our neighbourhoods and our business communities, and a number of, of my colleagues on this side of the House have shared those concerns on behalf of their communities and constituents with the government directly, with the ministers. Um, you know, and, and I've watched the change, and I'm not in those meetings with the government House leaders and folks, um, but from at the beginning, it was easier to connect to the ministries and to share some of those thoughts because we were all gathering this information real time. Um, and now. You know, now that the government has a lot of this information, now that we're pushing to, to have those pieces fit together in a, a better way, uh, this is where it feels like we're meeting with that resistance. So please continue to do the important work that may be challenging, but it is so necessary, and it should be shaped by the experience and expertise of the frontline workers, uh, whether they are grocery store workers who are, are wanting safe workplaces or working in meat pr processing, um, whether they are police on the front lines, whether they are nurses, PSWs, um, everyone has a voice in this and you have to listen to it. So this, is, this bill is talking about the, um, the government's framework for a gradual and safe reopening of the economy. Um, and certainly, as we've heard from the government and heard from the broader community and, and from these benches as well, we must do this with care and caution and make sure that we do it in the best way possible so that it doesn't become undone, so that people aren't at risk of harm. Um, the business community, they've been very vocal, very active. I have written a letter on behalf of Main Street businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, um, and they're still looking for support and resources. If, if it's as specific as helping them to transition to a digital and online platform with the digital Main Street um, and bringing that program back, whether it's talking about banning evictions or commercial rent relief, all of these things, it can't just be um, the, the tax deferral down the road. We need, we need help now, they need help now. Um, you know, we can all point to a favorite business that may not be there at the end of this, whether we already know that to be true or we are worried that that will be the case. Um, but those workplaces need to be kept safe. The workers need to be kept safe, the customers, um, the establishment. And I'll tell you, the other day I, I went into um, I went into a local a local store, and it was one of I, I do my best to, you know, make it only be um, as needed. But I was in there, and I was impressed um, by the the protocols um, that, and the measures that had been taken by that local business, with the 
plexiglass and the, you know, the dots on the floor and how you came in and where there was um, hand sanitizer and things were labeled and everybody, everybody knew the rules except the guy behind me and his daughter. And they didn't know the rules and they didn't care. <laughs> and not only did they not know the rules and didn't care, when it was pointed out politely by the sales clerk, they weren't happy about that, but they looked around and read the room and realized there were a bunch of other folks that were not impressed that they were not on their dot. Right? So it, it's a strange time, um, and I, I know that the businesses have communicated they need very, they want clear guidelines because they don't want to do something the wrong way and end up not just in trouble but endangering someone. Um, they want to be able to work with this government, so make sure that they have those opportunities. When the member from Tamiskaming Cochrane mentioned that the hotline, um, you know, that the businesses in his community and the tourism industry were referred to the hotline, and then the hotline turns out to be giving different information than, than, you know, that, than my colleague is hearing from the ministers. Um, that puts people in the risk of maybe getting in trouble, doing the wrong thing, potentially endangering the public, but that is not how we move forward um, it, with kind of a mishmash or hodgepodge or you know, chaos. Let's do things thoughtfully and take that feedback. When you hear that a hotline isn't working, make sure it does. You know, and there are so many examples of that, so do your best, please, because um, we haven't seen that in, in some of these areas. Uh, but we need consideration of safety, um, whether it's classrooms, farms, jails, food processing. These are workplaces, and you know, we're, you're, not, you're not setting up forward a, a positive track record on work refusals, you know, and people have to be kept safe. And it's not just about putting up a poster. Never was about putting up a poster. We're in uncertain times. This has to be very clear. Um, moving on, though, there are a lot of folks across the community who would like to be a part of that. And I have a letter here from uh, a community member, a constituent. His name is Arnaldo Benny, and he has um, written to this government. And I've shared his voice in here before, and he's a, um, a neighbor of ours who is on ODSP and who has asked the government um, to top up folks on ODSP and on social assistance, because right now, as he said, quote, it would help us in the long run so we could go to a store and buy stuff when this is over. My ODSP should be at par with CPPD. I get a raise on CPPD and they claw it back. He's making $955.48 a month and $310.15 on his ODSP, and that's his final. That's his take home. He said, what What's happening is that I've been the same for the last three years. Everyone else is getting a top-up, but not us. It will help my well-being, my mental health, and I can go out and do things. I like to be busy. If I get the top-up money, I might, I might be able to save it. Without it, it isn't sufficient to survive. We are well below the poverty level. Sometimes I can't afford a bus ticket. The bus is free right now, but not forever. But this is someone who has said that when, for, uh, when the Premier has said no to the bump-up for people on social assistance, he felt very alone. And when we hear um, my, my colleague from Windsor West and I were discussing it, that when the government is clawing back and the provincial government is taking money from that federal benefit, clawing that back from folks on social assistance, and then tell them to go to the food bank, that that's an option that may be on the website, that that's the direction. How about the direction is don't, don't claw back the money? That federal benefit, you know, if, if the province is snaking that money to pad their own coffers, um, you know, the federal government has asked you not to do that, but, you know, money is money, right? But that money goes a long way to folks who really need it, and these are uncertain times. We keep hearing that, but it's even more uncertain for the people who are in the margins. Um, this is National Accessibility Week, and people living with disabilities across this province have been living in deep poverty. They already faced barriers. COVID-19 has made it, like, immeasurably worse, and we are only now we are thinking about it now, but we, we have no way of, of knowing just how bad it will get for people who are tucked in corners right now and can't get out and don't have support, don't have that voice. So we, we cannot leave people behind. Um, I know that this, this, is a, this pandemic is massive. You know, we've heard it referred to as a beast. We've heard it referred to as a war. We've, we're all facing it, but we're not all in this together. We are all in this at the same time, but the people who are in, if they're lucky to have an apartment that they can't get out, folks, if they can't get out into the broader community, they're not in it together with us. They are in a corner without what they need, 
and we, are, we hope that they will be well enough to survive and come out the other side. So we are all in this at the same time but differently, and we have to ensure that we factor that in and have different approaches for different people. Um, I want to take a moment. My, my colleague from Niagara Centre is here and, and um, reminds me that there's a, a motion on the order paper. So government, hey, if you want to, it is there. There is a, a motion that you could bring forth, and we would be more than happy to discuss, debate, pass, um, make some changes. Um, but it's about it's calling for emergency um, operational funding for municipalities. You know, in line with what we've been hearing um, from FCM and AMO. But our municipalities are on that verge of having to make decisions uh, about service cuts, tax increases. Um, they, need, they need help. They are waiting, they're waiting for support from this level of government. Um, and I know that we all are aware of that, acutely aware of what we're hearing from our municipal and regional partners in our communities. So let's get on with it. Let's make those decisions. Let's, give, let's, let's work with them. Let's ensure that all of our neighbours are supported from all levels of government. Um, you know, if, if, if we're going to leave them just to flounder on their own, that is going to affect not just municipalities but our, our friends and neighbours. Um, connected to infrastructure, and I'll just touch on this, uh, this is a longer conversation that I look forward to having. Um, I wear a number of hats, of course, the critic for infrastructure, transportation and highways um, on behalf of the official opposition. But you know, something I'm hearing from some of the smaller tier municipalities and folks uh, across the province is a lot of folks are waiting for an answer from the ministry about their projects, their submission, about you know, um, when, when and if we are ready to um, get into construction with some of those projects, um, the infrastructure funding, they're not sure what will or won't be approved, timelines. I understand that we can't point to a timeline right now because there's so much uncertainty, but the municipalities want to be absolutely ready for when there is the opportunity to advance their community goals. Um, and they, the smaller municipalities, they cannot do these projects themselves, so please don't Please don't make them have to. Um, Health care. Uh, I've got a, a few things that I'd like to share. Personal protective equipment. We all say PPE now like it's, a, like it's a term that we all just knew. Some of us did, but personal protective equipment is required in different spaces, whether it's a, a non-permeable um, gown, if it's a, a mask, if it's an N95 mask, gloves. I mean, all of these things and face shields. Um, and I'm sure there'll be something new in the next, you know, in the next stretch of time um, that we're wanting to have that people need access to. You know, the minister has said on a, on a regular basis that hospitals and, and um, places have what they need in terms of PPE, that they've, they, they have what they need. So when I've spoken to the, the folks at the hospital, the government is referring to a two-week supply. Everyone has that two-week supply. But hospitals are looking forward to um, when they can do different kinds of surgeries, right? They're, they're looking to make plans for their next steps, and they can't, according to the rules, nor would anyone want them to, they can't move forward with those plans without having certain, um, certain amounts of personal protective equipment stockpiled. So if it's 15-day supply or 30-day supply or, or what have you for certain types of surgeries or for their rolling work, they need to have that on hand. And they're not able to necessarily procure it easily. And I know that our hospital has, has, um, has done some creative and, or innovative procurement um, for gowns. And, and I think we've got like a million gowns coming from somewhere that they heard about from someone else. Like, <laughs> we're, we're making it up as we go in... Um, in, in our, our communities to ensure that we have what we need. But anecdotally, we are hearing from the front lines concerns about, um, about their lack of access to PPE. Um, I've got a letter here from a concerned home support worker who actually, her PS, I'll start there, says, if this letter is shared with the public or my employer, please keep my identity concealed as I am concerned about repercussions. I'm starting there because when we have a private employer that you know we, we're going to tuck our problems in a drawer and we don't want we don't want people to know we end up with secrets we end up with problems we end up with people dying we look at our 
our long-term care um, and some of the gut-wrenching truths that are coming out and why we need a, a full public inquiry where it's not just, as the minister said, we don't just want to get to the bottom of it. We don't want to be able to take what we get at the bottom of it and bury it. I want public resources to go into a public inquiry as per the Public Inquiries Act 2009, that is a real process, right? That it's public resources that goes into this. It's a defined process. And that what comes out of it, what comes out of it can be useful. What comes out of it is public. People get to know what that is. A government commission, you decide the terms, you, the government decides all of the pieces, the players, the, the goals, and if there are any recommendations based on the findings, I don't know, we just trust you that you picked the right ones. So that's the difference between commission and inquiry. And the broader public, by the way, they're not fooled by that. They want, as I've, I've read this morning, um, they want to lift the, lids, the, lift the roof off of long-term care homes and all of us look inside. But this, this individual, this concerned home support worker said, due to the nature of our jobs, we're not able to distance ourselves from our clients. Since we can only access PPE after a positive COVID-19 test result, how are we to protect ourselves from contracting and, more importantly, from spreading it to a number of our clients, many of whom, who, whom are immune compromised, such as those who are on chemotherapy, have COPD, or a number of other conditions? And she had explained that they have to pre-screen before they go to a home to attend to a client. Um, and then based on the symptoms and what they confirm, then they have to get permission from their supervisor, and then they go to an office in Whitby, and Whitby covers a vast area, Whitby, Oshawa, Curtis, Bowmanville, Port Perry, Port Hope, Coburg, and more, and then they can get like a maximum of, at the time that this was written, uh, the end of March, perhaps this has changed, but a, a maximum of three paper masks and a gown. There is no supply of N95 masks, even for suspected cases. And you know the, the office is limited, and then they have to drive all over the place. So it's it's not a great system. This government earlier today, though, is ramming through the passage of that you know uh, changing home care, uh, making it more um, able to be privatized. Well, we've seen how well that has gone in long-term care. That's a topic of conversation in the grocery store. In like people across the community are now talking about long-term care that had not necessarily been politically engaged or active or knowledgeable on the subject. So now. Now this government is pushing through with home care, and we're not finding that the home care situation is, uh, is any better. And that's just what we can see. That's just what we can hear about. So let's not make it worse. Why wouldn't you put the brakes on it and do things properly? Anyway, I have, in terms of PPE and access, I have sheets and sheets here um, from the Ontario Nurses Association of examples across the province where um, there are reports of of insufficient access to uh, N95 masks, or if they have N95 masks that they're not properly fit, different challenges. Um, and while I don't, I, I understand that with a process unfolding that we are going to have hiccups along the way, but it, this is, these are not hiccups along the way. These are stories that I would be glad to share directly with the minister um, to actually investigate, to make sure that things are as the government I would hope hopes them to be, but I'm going to come back to um, to talk about personal protective equipment and access. We are grateful to the businesses that are coming forward, that are volunteering to make gowns, make face shields, um, to the companies like General Motors that you know we had written a letter on April 15th and community had called for it, and General Motors, like they're doing in Warren, Michigan, are now making uh, surgical face masks. That's great. Um, but what about when some of the companies that are volunteering, when we get back to business, if, if the economy opens in a successful way and they're able to get back to manufacturing or making their own products, are we going to lose some of that supply chain of the things that we need? So this government needs to make sure that we have in place how we get those supplies, not just crossing our fingers and being grateful for the volunteer businesses. So here's, here's a thought. Let's have the government use its, you know, flex its muscles and, and use its pull, and let's invite General Motors to also make N95 masks because we don't have anyone in the province, I'm, I'm pretty sure not in Canada, that are making N95 masks. So where does our supply come from, other than the kindness of strangers? Let's make them in the province. General Motors is doing it now, making a percentage of their masks in Warren, Michigan. So that is the template. This is not a pipe dream. 
This is not some magical you know, unicorn idea. We're seeing it in Warren, Michigan. Let's, let's see that in Oshawa, where they're now manufacturing the masks. Let's move forward to have that, because we need to build capacity, whether that is with um, supply chain of personal protective equipment, whether that's capacity for testing, or whether that's capacity for contact tracing. We need to ensure that this province can move forward together in the best way, and that, that depends on this government. Thank you. Thank you very much.